So, so today we're starting Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Um, in this class, we're just going to spend a week on it. And we're only going to look at two, two books of it. If this was the ethics class that you'll take two years from now, and it was my ethics class, we'll spend about three weeks or so on Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, and we'll look at it a bit more carefully. Um, and if any of you are actually really interested in that, you can, you can see the videos from that class um, that are on YouTube as well because I, I've given lectures in that ethics class about book one. And I'm going to give you a somewhat different lecture and discussion than I did with the ethics class, because we have somewhat different interests. Um, so when we think about ethics, this is often what we're thinking of, right? What is good or bad, or right or wrong? And we're typically thinking about people's actions. You know, what, what is a good action, what's a bad action? A lot of times our, our codes for ethics are encapsulated in um, a, a sort of list of statements, right? You should do this, you shouldn't do this. What would be a code like that that you could think of? Sometimes they, we get in controversies over whether this should be in courtrooms or not. <coughs> Ring a bell with anybody? I'll give you a hint, there's ten of them. Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments, right. The Ten Commandments is an ethical code. And it says, um, what? You know, it hits on really the basic, big basic things. There's some things in there that are purely religious, like, you know, you'll keep the Sabbath holy. Um, but there's a lot of things in there like, you shouldn't kill people, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't lie. You know, so false witness means. Um, it goes on actually to talk a little bit about... Um, not just what you ought to do, but also how, how you ought to be or feel, right? You shouldn't covet your neighbor's wife or possessions or this or that. Wives shouldn't you know, covet neighbor's husbands as well. Um, so it prescribes behavior, prescribes desires. Um, that's an example of an ethical code. Um, some of you are going into professions that are going to have ethical codes too. Or you'll work at a company that has a code of ethics, right? And that'll say, well, you can do this or you can't do this. Um, you guys actually are all under a code of ethics, the student conduct code, right? Um, did you have some discussion of that in orientation when you first came in here as students? What do they tell you about it? I don't know because, you know, just follow this, here, read it, now we're done. Is that what they did? Or Really? Um, <coughs> what's in it? Yeah. Well, I guess sort of like uh, abstaining from drugs and alcohol if you're underage. To... Yeah, you're supposed to follow certain okay. certain rules. Um, what about hitting other <coughs> students? Is that okay? What if they really provoke you? <laughs> what does the student have to come say? Does it have a little provision in there that says, normally you shouldn't hit people, but if somebody's really got it coming to them, then maybe it's okay. It's probably pretty <coughs> categorical, right? It probably says, no, you shouldn't do that at all. Um, probably got some things in there about internet use, I'm guessing. You know, um, Has a lot of stuff in there about things specific to students, though, doesn't it? There's an honor code. Actually, if I want to, when I, when I give you assignments, I can click a little box that requires you to affirm that you know, you're following the honor code when you complete the assignment. I haven't used that because you know, I'm, I'm assuming you all know the honor code uh, better than I do. But I'm, you know, I'm guessing it includes things like you're not going to plagiarize, you're not going to present somebody else's assignment as your own, you're not going to buy assignments, all that sort of stuff. Does that ring a bell? Now, those, those have to do with you know, good and bad actions. Um, it's good for you to write your own papers. And if you don't write your own papers, then you're bad. You're a bad student. But, you know, that just gives us some ideas about how we classify things. Does it tell us why things are good or bad? I mean, you could probably figure out why it's a bad idea for you to um, go to a paper mill and buy a paper. <coughs> but does the code actually tell you that? Not really. Not really, yeah. Um, it leaves it up to you to figure that out. There are certain approaches to ethics that just say, here's what you should do, here's what you shouldn't do. Okay, we're done. Um, Aristotle doesn't do that. 
Aristotle and some of the other people we're going to look at this semester, or like Plato when we looked at, they're concerned with um, the effects that our actions have on us, not just on other people, but on us, and the kind of life that they, they make for us. So let's think, for example, let's use this example of um, you have to write a paper. And we can just go on through all this stuff, you know, about final causes and all that. Okay, a final cause is something that we call an end, a purpose. What's the purpose in writing a paper? <coughs> Why do you write papers? Just because you love it? Does that, any of you sit in your dorm room and just like write papers <coughs> ahead of time just in case the instructor might ask you for a paper on, on Kant somewhere down the line, you research mm -hmm. it and you write it? There might be a student somewhere who does that. I doubt that any of you are that student, right? I wasn't that student. Why do you write papers? Yeah. Because um, they're assigned to us. Okay. So you write the paper to fulfill an assignment. Why do you care about that? Why is that important? It sounds kind of, you know, silly to ask, doesn't it? Well, of course, it's an assignment. You have to do it. Again, you know, a lot of the places that I've taught before, <coughs> Marist students are, are pretty good with, like, doing what you ask them to do. I've been at places where you assign things and less than half of the class actually does them. Because there's this kind of a disconnect there. They don't, they don't grasp what you students sort of intuitively grasp because you've been more or less brought up well. You've been habituated into thinking about things the right way. Why do you complete assignments? You get a good grade. Yeah, that's that's key. Because the assignment is a component of your grade for the, the semester, and the zero really affects your grade, right? Um, that's another lesson that so many of my <laughs> students at other places, they would not do half of the assignments and then be like, Oh, so I've, I've got an F. I really need to bring my grade up to a C. What can I do? And I'd be like, well, I mean, there's not much you can do at this point. You know, all those zeros, even if you, you know, aced the, the final exam, you're, you're going to have an F. Um, so, you know, consistently doing good, good work gets you a good grade in the class. And why do you want a good grade? There might be a lot of reasons, right? Let's think about the reasons. Why? Why do you want a good grade? Why do you individually want a good grade, say, in this class? Why do you care? I know you do. Because every one of you is here day after day after day ready for class. So we can, uh, I guess we can get a credit for the class. Okay, so it's, it's progress towards uh, graduation. Is that the only reason? I don't think so for, for most of you. It might be for some of you, and if that's the case, that's okay. I, I don't you know, judge people because of that, especially with uh, required classes. You know, um, I spent my last several years just teaching required classes, just to, actually to, to non-philosophy majors um, who didn't want to be in the classes. So um, I, I understand the motivation of just wanting to get, get things done, but I'm willing to bet that's not the only motivation for most of you. Why else do you care about your, your grade in this class? I can think of two reasons right off the, the top, yeah. Uh, you know, maybe your parents pressure me? That's one of the ones I thought of. Um, now, your parents actually can't see your grades, you know, because of FERPA. That, that, I forget exactly what it stands for. It's some sort of law, and it has to do with, you know, what, what of your information can be disclosed. <laughs> I'm willing to bet, though, most of your, your parents still want to see your grades, right? <coughs> and if you have all D's for the semester, how's that going to pan out at Christmas time? Not good. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's understating it, I, I suspect, right? Especially since, you know, this is a private school. So this, you know, this isn't just going to community college, you know, or to, to a state school where things are still fairly cheap. This is, you know... Somebody's paying for this, and they want to see a return on investment, as they, as they call it, right? Why else, though? So you want to you want to satisfy somebody else. You care about <laughs> that. Yeah. You want to get into graduate school or get a good job. 
Okay, so um, beyond graduation, you want to, let's call that um, career stuff. And th that's a good point, because you know you can graduate <coughs> with a 2.0, but that's probably not going to be what you need to get in, in, in grad school, right? Um, what else? Yeah. So that you can learn. <laughs> Isn't yeah. that why we're in class? To learn. <laughs> Yeah, learning, um, knowledge. What were you gonna say? So you like feel good about yourself? Yeah, that's the other one I was I was actually thinking of is let's call it self-respect. Um, you know, you can you can get by, you can slough off and just get by um, for a long time, <clears throat> but you notice that has effects on the way that you feel about yourself. When you live up to your potential, you feel better about yourself. <coughs> When you excel, when you write a good paper, let's go back all the way to here. When you write a good paper, um, you notice that you don't just get a grade. You actually feel better about yourself in the process. And you probably do learn something. I mean, if it's a good paper, you're demonstrating that you learned something. Well, oftentimes, these two are connected, the self-respect and the learning. When you realize the sort of progress that you've made, you know, and, and you're surprised by how much you actually know. Um, that feels pretty good, doesn't it? Sort of like you know, finding a skill that you didn't didn't originally have. So it's better than actually reaching into your pocket and finding a twenty dollar bill that you left in there, uh, which which happens to me sometimes. Sometimes it's just a dollar bill because I'll go to a conference and shove some money into a coat. That's that feels good, but that's a different kind of good feeling than actually accomplishing something, isn't it? What if, what if you were to just buy a paper? <coughs> you could get by, right? You could graduate. There are people who do this. I don't know if it happens at Marist, but it happens at some schools where they buy papers their entire career. You won't be ready for grad school if you do that. That's that's good, right? I mean, you could you could buy A grade papers the entire time. Let's say you don't get caught. What happens when you say go to you know? Let's take a professional school. You go to law school. And now you're actually required to perform at a much higher level. What's going to happen to you? You're, you're not going to be able to, to do it. Um, your parents will be okay because they won't know, right? Um, what happens to your self-respect if you're if you're buying papers? How many of you would do it? If you, let's say you had, you were really forced to do it, you were really under the gun. This is a critical class for you. It's let's say it's your last semester. If you don't pass this class that you've really been struggling with, you're not going to graduate. And a lot of things have been happening in your life that you didn't have any control over. Like let's say you know a sibling was really sick and you were taking care of them, and now it's the last minute and you need a paper. <coughs> you don't have it. Um, if you don't buy a paper. One of your friends comes to you and says, I know a site where you can buy a paper for 50 bucks. If you don't buy that paper, um, you're not going to graduate on time. Um, I, I won't actually ask how many of you <coughs> because that's kind of a hypothetical situation. But you can understand the temptation. How many of you would be tempted to do it? Yeah, I, that's understandable, right? And if you would feel tempted, you can probably sympathize with somebody else who would feel you can understand their, their position, can't you? Um, how would that affect your self-respect later on? It, it would have an effect on it, wouldn't it? Um, and you wouldn't learn anything in the process other than maybe what's in that paper as you read through it. You're like, wow, this is pretty good. Um, this, is, this is the sort of thing, means ends reasoning, um, going from means to goals or ends, and then thinking about the goals or ends or purposes of those, and then going on like that, that we have to do if we want to understand ethics well. So, I mean, this was a, <coughs> and this is good or bad, right? Writing your own papers is good. Not writing your own papers is bad. But why? Well, that all has to do with this stuff over here. It's not just because not writing your own papers is in the honor code. That's a bad thing. It's in the honor code is a bad thing because all of this stuff over here matters and matters more in 
in some respects than the actual action of writing your own paper. Um, so we, we not only need to know what is good or what is right or wrong, we need to know the key question, which is why? And you remember, this goes back to what we've been talking about for a week, why is asking for a cause? Right? The answer to, to why is because. Because what? Um, so now let's think about happiness. So what makes what actually makes you happy? We're going to look at the whole spectrum. Um, what makes you happy? <coughs> so. My family, my friends. Okay, so let me erase this, because we're going to need pretty much the whole board, I think. Um, family, friends, which aren't quite the same thing, right? I mean, they can overlap. But like they say, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. Right? You can to a certain extent. You know, when, you know how you can pick your family to a certain extent? Who you're going to marry. Because when you marry somebody, as the expression goes, you don't just marry them, you marry their family. And you might say, oh, that's BS, you know, we're all independent people. But it, there, there's actually some truth to that. You know, if you can't stand that person's family, um, imagine that you're going to be seeing them every Christmas and Easter and Thanksgiving and stuff like that and dealing with them. Um, so family and friends. Who, who else had family and friends? This, is, this pans out pretty much with the other class that I had, the ethics class, when I asked the same question. Almost everybody put family and friends. What other things do people have? Um, yeah. I just said, I guess, being good health. Yeah, that's important too. Um, <coughs> health is a good. Uh, what did you have? Um, I had food and sleep. Food and sleep? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Those may uh, conduce to health. <coughs> food and <coughs> sleep. But we'll come back to food because there's a lot of ways we can think about that. Yeah. Being successful. Okay. Um, Success, and that will be one that we'll have to specify a little bit more as well. Who else had something different? Um, yeah. Well, I was going to say the same thing, like achieving goals, but also God. Yeah. Uh, this is one that Aristotle doesn't talk about, mm -hmm. but since, um, you know, Judeo-Christian values got into our culture, um, some people think that, that God might be the highest end of life. Um, when we look at Thomas Aquinas, Later in the semester, he thinks that happiness ultimately consists in, in that. Um, what else? What are, I know that people had some other things as well. What else makes you happy? Yeah. I said sports. Okay. Uh, <coughs> playing or watching? Either. Okay. Playing. <coughs> I'm very happy right now, actually, myself, because... My team not only won the Super Bowl last year, they're 4-0, they're you know, the Green Bay Packers. So I can, I can quite relate to that. Um, and the only other team that's 4-0 is in the same division, so that means they're going to collide pretty soon. So a big, big drama. <coughs> what else? What are other things? Yeah. Music. Music, yeah. Some people can't live without music. Um, yeah. Relaxing, like resting. Okay, we I guess it goes along with sleep. <coughs> yeah, let's put let's put that over with sleep. Sleep or relaxation. <clears throat> you might need a different kind of thing with relaxation, though. It's like not having to do something. Oh, we call that leisure. All right? Remember, Aristotle says philosophy, metaphysics can only happen when humanity actually has enough leisure to be able to do it. And it's not the carpenters or the tradespeople who are doing it. It's the people who actually have some time on their hands. Oh, you, you're going to say. I was say holidays. Holidays. Okay, that's interesting. I've I've never heard that as an answer to this. Hmm. What is it about holidays? Just because they're happy. Okay. Um, let's. But I guess actually, they're kind of like all of that combined, sort of. Let's actually um, <coughs> put that down. Because that, that, that's an interesting answer. Holidays. I can understand that. Um, holidays can also be the most stressful time of the year, too, if, if they're managed very badly. <laughs> yeah. Um, nice weather. 
that's another one that I haven't um, heard before. But, you know, again, that makes good sense. I had, um, when I went to, to undergrad, it was in Wisconsin. And um, Wisconsin's about on the same latitude as here. So you all know, you know, the days get shorter and the nights get longer. We're already moving <coughs> towards that. I had friends who would work um, uh, second and third shift jobs. And so they would, they would actually be asleep during the day. And there's something called seasonal affective disorder, right? SAD. You guys have heard of that? So we used to call it being stir crazy. People actually get depressed because they're not seeing the sun <coughs> for days and days on end. And it, that does, in fact, affect us. That, that has an uh, effect on us. Yeah? Um, love. Ah. Yeah. Uh, uh, sort of just general love or romantic love or I guess like general because like when you're like I guess for holidays like when you're holidays like you're with your family and you love your family so like that makes you happy and then yeah. like if you have like a boyfriend or girlfriend well that's romantic love right yeah it's not just because uh, you don't want a boyfriend or girlfriend but you just they're, they're <coughs> nice to be around but you don't you're not attracted to them right mm -hmm. that romantic love is is something important some people can actually become addicted to that it, it's that good of a a feeling. This is a pretty good list. You guys have any others in here? So this is the, the totality. Um, let's, so let me put like a line here. Is there anything for this second question, what do you think a happy life for you is going to include? Um, what is the kind of life that you're shooting for? Is there anything in this list that um, or is there anything, any question, any answers to this question that aren't on this list already? Yeah. Um, well, I said uh, having money, having uh, okay. wealth. So let me ask this um, for the whole class. All of you, of course, need some money, right? Because you can't can't do anything without some money. You want to go to Starbucks, you need some about five bucks just about to get a, a decent latte. Um, or mocha or whatever, whatever you happen to like. So you, you all need some money. Money is not that big of a value for you right now, right? Compared to other things. Uh, but you anticipate in the future it will be. How many of you think it's going to be a, a really important value for you? How many of you are thinking about going into careers and one of the reasons why you want to go into that <coughs> career is you want to make a lot of money? Just a few? I mean, that's, that's a motivator. Um, money is important. A any other things that were in your list of where you're trying to go that aren't over here besides money? Yeah. I said traveling. Okay. Traveling. Enjoying going to different places. Um, yeah. Uh, I also said uh, owning a home. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you, you, no, I'm just, you, you're just playing with your pen. Yep. Okay. Let's work with what we've got here. This is a, this is a great list. Um, um, so, Aristotle talks about some of these. And actually, if we think about certain of these, we could kind of roll them into each other. Or we could say that we like them because of other things. Um, having a home, it's interesting that you said a home, not a house, right? There is a difference between a house and a home. Um, these are, fit into the generic category of what we call wealth. Your, your possessions. Um, your wealth is not just the money that you have in your wallet, it, it also includes the clothes that you have, the, Possessions, the toys, the tools, all those sorts of things are, are your wealth. Um, for some of you, your wealth might also consist in intellectual capital. You know, you guys are acquiring important skills. Um, that could be part of your, your wealth, your abilities. But for the most part, how do we, we think of wealth? We think of it in terms of money. Things you can buy with money, things that you can, you can have with money. Or money itself. 
Um, and wealth is important. Aristotle doesn't think that, that wealth is useless. Um, there's a lot of things in here <coughs> that could fit in with another motive that he talks about, which is pleasure. Right? Um, why do people like to watch sports? Are, are they improving their minds thereby? I mean, maybe I'm learning stats about you know this this person's career. Is that really important knowledge? Unless you have to be a sportscaster or something like that. What's important knowledge to have? Yeah. Knowledge that can get you places in life. Knowledge that can get you places in life. That's a good, a good, broad, generic answer. Um, that can cover a lot of ground. Yeah. What were you gonna say? Common sense. Common sense. Yeah. And actually, it's interesting. Common sense has to be developed, right? It's not something. I remember when I was a kid, I didn't have a lot of common sense. And uh, I remember my dad, maybe you guys can relate to this, seeing me do some things and saying, God, you just don't have any common sense. And I'd say, well, what should I have done? Common sense would have told you, do this, right? But now you probably have some. And I know I, I've developed quite a bit. Um, well, back to pleasure. So you watch sports events. There could be some other motives. You watch your kid playing because you feel a kind of sense of pride in doing so, or you want, you're going to watch to support the team, right, you're doing it for the other person, but for the most part we watch sports because we like to watch sports. What were you going to say? We like to see people like succeed at levels that we might not be able to. That's interesting. Like when people watch sports, they see people do all these extraordinary things that they realize that a lot of them couldn't do. Yeah, and the same thing goes for movies too, doesn't it? Yeah, a lot of extraordinary things happen. Yeah, we, we can't all be mutants who save the world, or um, what are some other popular things? We can't all date Gwyneth Paltrow, um, or whatever male lead you like. Um, I don't know who's hot. Brad Pitt, I guess. You know, although he's probably dated for you guys, right? He's probably too old. Um, no? <laughs> okay. Um, what else can't you do that, that does happen in movies? Um, well, travel. I mean, you, you can't travel to a lot of the places that are depicted in the movies because they're actually sets. And they don't exist anymore. You know? Um, oh, you can't fight medieval battles. Um, or fight dragons, or fight aliens, or... Maybe you can't fight aliens if they show up. <laughs> maybe some of you will get to. Um, yeah, so getting to put yourself into kind of a story or see, see amazing things. Again, that's a, that's a kind of pleasure that people have. Um, food is also a good example. I mean, you, you, food is a good. If you don't eat any food, what happens to you? Yeah, either you die or they take you to the hospital <laughs> and they, they start, you know, um, giving you the, the food down a tube, down your throat, or they, they you know, put it in through your veins or stuff like that. Because you have to have food to exist. That's not all that we do with food, though, is it? Who, who lives on food that's just what they need and they're not concerned about the taste at all? Any of you? Just eat oatmeal all day long? Oatmeal is my, my sort of prime example of boring food. Maybe you like oatmeal. I don't. I, I eat oatmeal <coughs> sort of doing penance. Um, and also because now that I'm older, you know, if I want to be healthy, I'm supposed to eat oatmeal for my heart, so I eat oatmeal. And I hate it. Um, but I eat it like, you know, three, four times a week. Um, I'd rather have cookies. Because cookies taste good, right? Um, food can bring you a lot of different kinds of pleasures. Think about the Culinary Institute of America. I've talked about it a couple times because it's right down the road from you. And if you haven't gone there, you should go there and just see some of the amazing things that these people do with food on a routine basis, day after day after day. Take the, take the tour. Um, especially go, go in and take the tour part where you see the, um, the cake making and the chocolate making and the, the just amazing things that these people do. Um, 
Those are to delight not just the, the palate, but also to delight the eyes, the ears, all those other, the imagination. That's about pleasure, right? Um, what else? You might be, you might have your friends just for pleasure's sake. I hope that all of you have some friends that you find pleasant to be with. Because what's the alternative? You could be friends with them just because they're useful to you because they pay your way for things, right? There are people who aren't friends on, on that basis or have associations. Aristotle understands that. Um, hope your family is pleasant to be with. If, if holidays are pleasant for you, odds are it's because your family is actually pleasant to be with. If you don't have such a family, and I, I know some friends of mine who don't, you're probably not going to like to spend a lot of time with those people. Um, nice weather, I think, is probably a matter of pleasure as well, isn't it? You know, today's a beautiful day. It's almost a shame to be inside. Um, it's not going to be so nice pretty soon, is it? Except for those who really like cold and snow and slush and slipping and your fingers and toes hurting. Someone doesn't like winter. What's that? Someone doesn't like winter. Someone doesn't like winter? I love winter. You love winter. Well, that's, that's good. You will derive a lot of pleasure from it. You know what I like about winter? Being inside. <laughs> well, that, and I, I also like um, doing some of the activities outside, like shoveling the snow, believe it or not. And I like, um, I like seeing all the, the ice on the trees. That's kind of pretty. But as I've gotten older, I don't do too much. Stuff. But, but if you like it, more power to you. You get pleasure out of it. Pleasure is a good. Pleasure is a good thing. We pursue pleasure because we actually enjoy it. And Aristotle doesn't think that you should try to avoid pleasure, you know, for its own sake, and you should live a life devoid of pleasure. He understands that that's, that's important. Um, what else do we have in here? Success. Um, now that's one we have to explore a little bit. So what does being successful consist of? It might just be being wealthy, but I, I, I bet that for most of you, being successful is not just a matter of being wealthy, is it? What else makes up success for you? This goes back to what, what do you imagine a happy life for you is going to be? First of all, where are you, where are you successful usually? Are you successful in how, how well you sleep? Are we talking about people being successful there? Are we talking about people being successful because they eat really good food? Probably not. I, I, I suppose we could think of some way in which that could be success. So what do we think of when we're thinking of success? What do you guys, what, what's success going to be like for you? I hope all of you are going to be successful. Like getting knowledge and also like uh, graduating for, um, for, from, from college. Okay, so that, that's sort of an intermediary type of success and those are all important things. Gaining knowledge. <coughs> all of you should come out of college a lot smarter <coughs> in certain ways than you came in, right? Um, otherwise, you're wasting your money or you're wasting somebody else's money. Um, and Getting the, the uh, certificate, getting the, the bachelor's, um, that's, that's a measure of success. Um, what else? What's going to come after that for, I'm guessing, all of you? A career. Yeah. Now, some are planning to go to grad school, right? Um, what are some of the other things you want to do other than stay in school for a longer time? Which I can understand. I like being in school. What else? Getting a good job. Getting a job, right. So there's going to be something that you're going to do. Some of you are going to be working as psychologists. Some of you are going to be buying and selling things. Some of you are going to be making people happy, you know, clients happy in one way or another, You know, trying to figure out what it is that they actually want deep in their heart and then make that happen. Some of you are going to be doctors. Some of you are going to be lawyers. Um, some of you are actually um, going to discover that you like working with your hands. And you'll get a BA or a BS or a BPS and then switch careers and become a baker or a carpenter or, or something like that. 
But for all of you, you will be doing something. Actually, some of you may end up um, staying, staying at home and doing things. Some of you may become writers. Some of you may just run a household. But there are measures for what counts as success in that, right? What does a successful career look like? Yeah. I think it's something that makes you happy. Ah. That's, that's a good point. What, what does actually make you happy with respect to work? Being able to achieve all those kinds of things. Like so just a the job that helps you achieve those things, and money is a part of it, I guess. Okay, so, that's, so these are all sort of ends then for the job. What, is there any, are there any jobs that you like doing by themselves, and you would do even if you didn't get some of these other things? This is part of the difference between <clears throat> a career in the strict sense and, or a calling and a job. When I, when I was a kid, we had to read um, this papal encyclical, which was on, on human labor. And um, it made a distinction between having a job, which is a good thing to have a job, because you can provide you know, for your family, you can contribute to the community, you can do all these sorts of things, and then having a calling. I'm guessing that... Um, many of you have a calling to the kind of work that you're eventually going to be doing. It may not actually be what you think it's going to be right now. Um, I, I, I would have never guessed when, you, when I was your age that I was going to be a college professor and that I'd love being a college professor and be happy doing it and uh, see myself doing it the rest of my life. If you would have told me that when I was your age, I would have said you're nuts. Because... Uh, Actually, at your age, this is going to really strike you kind of funny. Um, can you guess what, it, what I thought I was going to be? Like, probably not. Because it's really crazy. I was going to be a mercenary. I, I went in the army so I could gain experience. Uh, I became a combat engineer so I could learn how to handle demolitions. And do you know infantry kind of stuff? And I was in a bunch of you know the guys that I ran with in high school. One of them had an uncle who was actually a mercenary, and um, had made money with that. And so we all studied, yeah. So we all studied martial arts, and we all went in the army to gain experience. And we had this big plan that we were all going to get together after we, we did our time. Um, and we you know studied extra languages, and we'd go out and bivouac, and and make improvised munitions and roll things up when we were, when we were your age. Um, we were pretty, pretty motivated, pretty crazy too. Now, all of that just, you know, that was a pipe dream. I didn't end up going that way. And then I, I had to think about what I was going to do. And again, you know, I went to school like you guys did. And I, I can't say that actually at your age I applied myself all that much as an undergraduate. I kind of screwed around a bit. Um, and I got a degree in philosophy and I got a degree in mathematics. But then I didn't go to graduate school right after that. I worked as a, I worked as what we now call a barista, you know, in a coffee house, and as a, a third shift security guard in a big office building. At the same time, and then you know, just studied languages on, on the side and um, worked out a lot. That was it. And then I ended up applying for graduate school a year later because I realized you know this working stuff um, with just a BA. Uh, in philosophy and mathematics, kind of, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't what I really wanted to do. Um, and I had to decide, should I go for math or for philosophy? And I love philosophy more than I love mathematics. Um, but I didn't sort of think ahead about what am I actually going to do with a philosophy PhD. I just wanted to study philosophy, so I went to grad school for that. And then it turned out that this is more or less what you do with it. You know, there's a lot of other things you can do, too. But I really like doing this. I, I enjoy doing this. And even if, even if it didn't bring me friends or it doesn't give me a lot of sleep um, or necessarily a lot of money or wealth or anything like that, um, it certainly doesn't do anything with sports, I would keep doing this. And I, I still do keep doing this because I, I really find satisfaction in it. So, Part of what I hope for all of you guys is that you have something like that 
and success for you will be more than just getting a lot of stuff for the work that you do. I hope that you do get a lot of stuff for what you do. So if you put in a lot of hard work, <coughs> there should be some compensation, right? But I hope that all of you find something in your life that you can do eight hours a day that you love doing. That would be great. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of things that, that we could think of with success. You could think of somebody being a big shot, having a reputation, right? That's an important part of success for some people. For other people, it's that satisfaction in, in what you do. Um, that's part of what Aristotle calls virtuous activity. So when you were reading through this and you read virtuous activity, you're like, what, what, what the hell, you know, what is that? Um, think about the career that you're going to have. You know, maybe, maybe you're going to be a doctor or a nurse or a social worker or something like that, where you're actually helping people, um, your virtuous activity will be doing that well and improving people's lives. If you are a carpenter or a contractor or a plumber or something like that, it's going to be improving people's lives through building well, through uh, fitting pipes well. Um, those of you who are doing the fashion thing, it will be bringing pleasure to people's lives. And like we said earlier, you know, a couple of days ago, I think, making people actually feel good about the way they look by giving them clothes that make them look good. That will be part of success if that's where you're headed. So, what are some other things? Are there any other things that you could think of? that make other people happy <coughs> that we don't have on this list. <coughs> Here's where we can get, you know, talk about crazy things. Think about some of the celebrities and, and the things that you look at their lives and you're like, well, I guess that must be what they really like, but I can't picture that working for me. Or people who have lives that are totally screwed up. They want something. They desire something. And they're probably getting it. Um, what are some some other things that people desire or want that you can think of? Yeah. Like attention. Ah, yeah. That's a good one. Um, people <coughs> often want attention for doing something before they've actually done it. And then that's why they, they do it, and you can say, they're not doing it because they love that or because they think it's a good thing. They just want attention from, from us, right? And people do a lot of stupid things for attention. Uh, what else? What are other crazy things? Well, not necessarily crazy, just not likely to be candidates for the good life that people want. Some people just want to get high all the time, you know. Depending on the drug, we often call them addicts. You know, if you're if you're hooked on heroin or meth or crack, your life's over, practically speaking. You, you might be able to manage for a little while and keep things together, but pretty soon, you know, <coughs> everything's going to be gone. Um, and, well, you know, but. People who have those sort of addictions, they're constantly on the make to try to get that drug. And why do they want that drug? You know, it has to do with pleasure. People, people like drugs because drugs are very pleasant. They're also, you know, pretty harmful for you. That's, that's why we tell you not to take them. Um, and you also don't get a lot done if you're, if you're doing drugs, unless, to a certain extent, meth, you know, and, and cocaine. Cocaine is like the, the drug that, that high performers would, would take back in the 80s so they could, you know, stay awake all night and, and perform. But it really destroys your body, and it destroys your mind, too. But that is something that people think is going to make them happy, isn't it? Otherwise, they wouldn't do the drugs. Can you think of anything else like that? Things that we can look at and say, that's, that's not a good idea. But people pursue uh, overeating unhealthy foods. 
Yeah, I mean, food can be used and food can be abused. Um, or how many of you have seen these reality shows like Hoarders? How many of you have seen that show? Um, that's, a, that's pretty amazing, some of the stuff that those people live in. And it has to do with, you know, holding on to possessions. But it's not possessions like that, you know, we tend to think of. It's just a whole bunch of stuff. You know, some of it gone bad. Um, what else? What are some other... The reality shows are probably a great way to think of some of these things. Um, attention, a lot of attention-seeking people in reality shows. Are there any other things that people want from those? Yeah. Acceptance. Acceptance, yeah. Well, that might not, that's probably a good thing, right? Well, but what if you want to be accepted for something like that? Oh. That's a good question. Um, let's think of some examples. To be accepted for something that's bad. So you'd, you'd be looking to be accepted by people who have a screwed up idea about mm -hmm. what's good and bad. So you want to get in good with, well, I'll give you an example from my, from my own life like that. Um, the crowd that I hung out with when I was in school was called the Burnouts. And um, I don't know if they have them anymore in, in high schools now, but these are the kids who, you know, wore, wore leather jackets or jean jackets and listened to heavy metal and, and got in fights and, you know, stole things and broke things and fought with the jocks and, and, um, was there a group like that nowadays, or? I guess. What made you act like that, though? Well, that's, that's a good question. Um, because I've never understood, like, why people... Some, <laughs> some of that had to do with acceptance. I was looking for acceptance from, from somebody. Into a certain amount of, like, a group of people. Like, you wanted to be accepted by a certain group of people. Yeah, and I, I liked the guys that I hung out with. Um, and, and I also, you know, I wanted to be kind of a, a tough guy. And, and uh... Um, you know, I had all sorts of crazy notions that I'd gotten from movies and songs. You know, I'm, when I tell you guys about this stuff, that say love songs are not a good guide to how you ought to run your life, I know, because I've actually done that. <laughs> so I, I was looking for acceptance from, from the, the wrong crowd. Um, and so I did a lot of stupid things, like getting in fights and, and, and stealing things along with other guys who were stealing things. And, um, you know, statute of limitations <coughs> were run out, so I, you know, I'm talking about it. And then afterwards you look at it, well, a lot of drinking. You think about that and you say, wow, was that stupid. What did I get out of that? Nothing. Yeah. Well, at least you learned the right things to do. So by knowledge. The, by, doing, by doing it wrong, I guess. Mm -hmm. Now you can tell us that it's bad to do that. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right. There is some value in that. But that's a very, that's a very conditioned, limited value. Um, Aristotle, let, let me put up what Aristotle says about these sort of things. So what is happiness? Um, Aristotle says, <coughs> we want to think in terms of means and ends. Wealth, the pursuit of wealth, the life of wealth getting cannot really be the happy life. Why not? Well, because why do you pursue wealth? What's it good for? other stuff, right? We've talked about this before. Money is only good because you can buy stuff with it. Um, having a beautiful house is only good because you can live in it, entertain friends in it. Um, it's not good in and of itself, is it? Those people who are on hoarders, they're a great example of people who have gotten screwed up somehow in their, their priorities, and they think just accumulating all this stuff is going to make them happy. What are the other candidates? He talks about pleasure. Um, so wealth is something we pursue for the sake of other things. Are the things that we pursue for their own sake? Pleasure, yeah. We do pursue pleasure for, our own, for its own sake, right? If you ask somebody, why are you doing that? And they say, because I like doing it. That's a reasonable answer, isn't it? Because I enjoy <coughs> doing that. Uh, <coughs> Reputation, or what he calls honor, that's that's something that motivates people too, isn't it? Bless you. That might tie in with what, what um, Ms. Doxy was calling acceptance. Um, or, you know, uh, who brought up attention as possibly a bad thing? Um, so attention could be reputation. Success can often be you're pursuing reputation. 
And, and it might be reputation in other people's eyes. It might be reputation in the eyes of somebody who's long dead. There are people who are trying to please dead parents uh, and show that they've actually made it. And, and it's, that's not a very happy life, actually. But they think that it's going to make them happy. What are we often valued for? What, you know, Aristotle says, why do people get a good reputation? It, it's for what he calls virtue. For uh, another way of thinking about virtue, moral goodness. Right? Somebody is a just person. Somebody is an honorable person. Um, that's why people like them. You know? You guys have probably already, at this point, sloughed off a few of your high school friends. And when it comes to Thanksgiving, this is, this is where the big test is. You're going to go home, and you're going to hang out with some of your high school friends, and you're not going to hang out with other of your high school friends. And hopefully the choice is not just based on who's in town. It's based on things like, who do you actually want to be with? Who can you relate to? Who is worth being around? Who's loyal? Who's um, going to stand up for you when you need them to stand up for you? That's called courage. Um, who can you rely on to make good decisions? Those are all virtues. That's one thing that some people think um, is worth pursuing. I, I suspect most of you do. And then, of course, there's, there's knowledge. And you can pursue knowledge just because, you know, you, you need it so that you can go to the next step in your career. Um, or you can pursue knowledge for its own sake. Again, one of my hopes for all of you is that you find something that you like to learn about just for its own sake. Not just to pass a class, not just to um, make it to the next step in your career, to know how to, you know, fix a flat, and things like that. But that you find something that you really enjoy knowing about and you get to spend time doing that. Um, maybe even do that as your career. So Aristotle says, okay, these are all pursued for their own sake, but they're also all pursued because people think they're going to bring them happiness. So let's think about these in turn. He says, could pleasure be, the life of pleasure, could that really be the life, the happy life? And he says, well, a lot of people think so. But there's something, there's something missing there. You can actually have a life full of all sorts of pleasures and still feel empty, still feel that there's something lacking. Um, and a lot of people don't, do go through this. They, they work their, their butts off, and then they make a lot of money, and then they buy a lot of nice things, and then they feel very empty inside. A lot of pleasures, if you, if you just pursue them, they end up, you know, not, not turning out to be so great. You know, you can think about um, romantic relationships are, are one example of that. You, you know, when you're in the courtship stage, you can't, you know, can't stand to not be with the person. Uh, everything they say is so funny or profound or, you know, it's so great and your heart's all aflutter and all that. And then, you, you know, you go out with them and it's, you're having a great time. And then uh, it turns out that three months later you realize you can't stand the way they laugh or the stuff that they laugh at or what else do people complain about? Um, they have other habits that annoy you. They're doing nothing with their life. They show no ambition. Uh, that's why they had so much time to spend with you uh, because they, they, they don't do anything. You know, um, All of their references are from pop culture and are really starting to bore you. Um, the movie quotes that they were they were you know using as catchphrases three months ago have gotten stale. Um, well, that's an example of pleasure not turning out to remain pleasurable. <coughs> so the life of pleasure is kind of a slavish life. I mean, you could you could say you can be merry. Um, that can satisfy you. If that does truly satisfy you, Aristotle says you're missing out on something distinctively human. These other things like knowledge or moral virtue, or even reputation or honor, those are more distinctively human. The life of, of sheer pleasure, yeah, a dog can live like that, a pig can live like that. Um, so what about these other ones? Well, reputation or honor, 
that's not really the be all and end all because why do people seek to be, you know, um, respected or honored or admired? It, it's for having some good quality, right? I mean, I think there are some celebrities who just want people to, to look at them. And they don't care whether they look at them in a good way or a bad way. They just want to be looked at, right? Does that jive with your, your take on some celebrities? So maybe that could be this. But most people actually want to be respected for something. You know? Um, what about this? Aristotle says, well, even virtue by itself is not complete. It's getting closer to, to what happiness is. But you can be virtuous and be asleep all the time. You know, you could have the right habits, but not actually exercise them. So what is happiness going to be for Aristotle? It's going to be a life of virtuous activity. That's the key thing there. Activity. It's going to have sufficient wealth. Um, because you have to have wealth. You're, Aristotle says if you're dirt poor, you can be a really good person, but you're going to have a miserable life. You know, if you can't afford medicine, you can't afford food, you can't feed, you can't feed, clothe, house your family. You can be a great person, but you're not going to be very happy, according to Aristotle. You might differ on that, right? Some of you may think that um, the life of a poor, you know, worker. <coughs> Um, taking care of other people might actually be a happy life. Aristotle doesn't think so. I'm not saying that you have to think that way. I'm just telling you what his view is. It's also going to be a life <coughs> with friends and family. Aristotle thinks that you guys are right. Friends and family are a constituent part of being happy. But he thinks that if you have friends and family and you have wealth, but you don't have virtuous activity, you're still not going to be completely happy. Um, some people put all their priority in, in friends and family, and they don't look at their own, their own life, their own character, and they, they don't end up actually being happy. If you actually do have a life of virtuous activity, Aristotle says it's going to be a <coughs> life. Because... You know, if what, what you know, does it for you is taking care of people, and you get to take care of people, you're going to be, you're going to enjoy that, right? If what really does it for you is um, getting to meet people, or, or traveling, or things like that, uh, and you actually get to do that in the course of your virtuous activity, you're going to have a, a pleasant life. Now, notice that you're not aiming at pleasure directly. Pleasure is sort of a byproduct of choosing something other than pleasure. If you try to shoot for pleasure straight off, very often you don't get it. Let's use the example of romantic love again, right? Because I think that's one you can all relate to. It's a great example. Um, you could try to find somebody who, right off the bat, has all the qualities that, that please you. You know, you could go on Match.com. Right? And uh, you, I, I've never actually been on one of those sites, but I assume there's something like a checklist. I'm looking for somebody who's, you know, tall rather than short, who has, you know, who's a non-smoker, who likes cats and dogs, who, you know, all, all these things. Is that, I don't know, does anybody, have any of you ever been on one of those sites or known anybody who used one of those sites? Let's assume it's like that, right? Would that actually make you happy? You know, you go out on a date with them, you're having a good time. You may not actually be happy in the long run, though. What about building a life with somebody? What, is, what does that take? How many of you have been in a long-term relationship, like something maybe six months or longer? So eventually you got kind of tired of the person you were with, right? They got on your nerves? Ever? How did you get through it? Tell them. Yeah, you tell them. How does that go? <laughs> <laughs> that can go bad a lot of nerves. <laughs> yeah, sometimes that, that's quite bad. Um, you work on, if you want to stay together, 
you actually have to like work on things. If you don't say anything, that's worse. Yeah, you're right. Because then you suffer in silence. And then you have to like put on a face of, oh, everything's okay. And they might see through that, or, or they might not. Um, a life that you live together is not going to be a life of, you know, as they say, wine and roses all the time. Um, but the pleasures that can come from a long-term relationship where you actually develop um, with that person, the pleasures that can come from that ultimately are much greater, much deeper. This is where we talk about intimacy. I mean, a lot of people talk about intimacy and they mean having sex with somebody. Um, and there, there is a certain, you know, sense to that because, you know, people are together and they're, they're enjoying themselves, hopefully, and, and all sorts of things are taking place and they feel this way and that way. But real intimacy is something that develops over a long time and, and actually takes some trials and requires you to make some choices. But the pleasures that can come with it as a result, not as what you actually aim for, are much greater than the pleasures that you would get just by going out and sleeping with whoever, you know, seems the best at the time. Um, Aristotle's, you know, this was true in Aristotle's time, it's, it's true in our time, it'll be true for, for your children as well. Um, so, Aristotle has given us one vision of human happiness. Um, let's end with, with this. Where else in our culture are people giving us visions of human happiness? On TV. Yeah, okay, so what are, what are some examples of that? Being we have wealthy, a happy... spending time with their family, everything's perfect, big house. Where do, you, where do you see that? Sitcoms. Yeah, some of them. Although sitcoms, they, they don't stay interesting long unless people have conflicts, right? Exactly. Um, Can't what? all be perfect all the time. Yeah, what else? And, well, and, and, and they may be trying to, you know, do a virtuous activity or something like that. What else? What other shows or things on TV are presenting you with visions of the happy life? Even very short visions. Sitcoms. When you watch reality shows, you get to see what other people think the happy life is. Sometimes they're totally screwed <coughs> up. But that's not telling you, hey, you should live like this. Would anybody tell you that you should live a certain way or see certain things as necessary for your happiness? In 30 seconds or less? Commercials, right. I mean, there's a whole industry out there that is trying to tell you this is going to make you happy, usually by appealing to pleasure or reputation or or wealth. Um, think about those Axe commercials, right? I used to, I, in, in one of my classes, I used to show, well, there would be like two days where I'd show commercials and then we'd do analysis on them. And I used those Axe uh, uh, Boom Chicka Wawa commercials. You know, Those are male fantasies that are being played out. And the reason why Axe sells so much is because there's a lot of guys out there who on a subconscious level are saying, I'm going to be happy if I buy it.